All right. Good morning, Bethany. Your European associate pastor with a Swedish accent is back. Praise God. So excited to be in the house of God. Happy Memorial Weekend. Yet another American holiday that my family had to Google. But now we know about it. So we're getting into things here. Now, if you've been hanging out in church these past few weeks, and, and I hope you have, you, you know that we're right in the middle of a series on the Holy Spirit. And you've been hearing some amazing messages from Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Wayne. And we're going to continue down that same road here today. And that's how I want to speak about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I'm excited about this. Back in Sweden, we have a Bible school and throughout the one year course, we have a day, few days of Q&A where the students get to ask all their questions about the Bible and faith and God. And actually throughout the years, the question about hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, how to be led by the Spirit of God is always gonna be among the top five questions. So if you have questions regarding that, how can I grow in hearing God's voice? You're at the right place at the right time, my friend. Hopefully, by the grace of God, we will bring some clarity to these questions. Now, as we look at hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, first of all, we need to establish that when God leads you and when God speaks to you, he does that in multiple ways. Amen? It's not just one way, it's multiple ways. Let me just give you a few so we we know kind of the perimeter of what we're talking about. Number one, the very first and most important thing in which God leads you and speaks to you is through the word of God. Amen. Amen. He will use his word, the eternal living word of God to speak to you and to lead you. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, I love this. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. And you know, when God breathes, what comes out is the Holy Spirit. He formed Adam in the dawn of creation and he breathed into him and thus he became a living human being because the Spirit of God entered into Adam. And then in, in John chapter 20, after the resurrection of Jesus, he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And here we read that the the, the word of God is God breathed. So that means that not only is the spirit inspiring the word, he inhabits the word of God. So when you read the Bible, not only are you getting information about God, you have fellowship with God, my friend. And the more fellowship you have with God, the more you read, the more familiar you will become with the person, the Holy Spirit. The better you will hear his voice and the better you will be led by that same spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, God also leads us in other ways. And one of those will be what I call godly traditions. Godly traditions, routines that we establish in our lives. Now, Some Christians, spirit-filled ones including, would kind of react negatively to the word traditions. Not you guys, just everybody else. You know, I hear some Christians go, oh, I don't like them traditions. I'm free in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, shalabalabalanda. You know, My friend, for the sake of your neighbor sitting next to you, I do hope you're in favor of the tradition of using deodorant daily. I do hope you're in favor of the tradition of brushing brushing your teeth every morning, washing your clothes once in a while, taking showers sometimes. (laughs) We have all these traditions and traditions themselves are neither right nor wrong. It depends on what you do. And there are godly traditions that we need to establish in our lives and in the lives of our family. Jesus had godly traditions. Repeatedly through the Gospels, he says that when the time of the Passover feast came, he went up to Jerusalem as was his custom. When the Shabbat came, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. Jesus had customs, godly routines, and so should we. Amen? A few of those godly routines, godly traditions would be like, for example, having a daily time of prayer. It would be your family blessing the food before you eat it. 
and one of the most beautiful traditions a Christian can have, go to church on Sunday. Every single Sunday, get yourself to the house of God, amen? We don't go to church on Sunday because every Sunday we feel up with a unique urge to go to church. We go to church because we're Christians. And that's what Christians do. It's a godly tradition that will bring you into the presence of God, that will have you sit under the word of God, and that will have you worship the Lord with your sisters and brothers. And God will use that godly tradition to lead you and to speak to you, amen? I want to read with you from Acts chapter 3. If you brought your Bible, you're welcome to go there with me. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to look at one godly tradition in the life of Peter and John that have them led by the Holy Spirit at a certain point. Acts chapter 3 verse 1 says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. I love that. Please, people of God, realize that this is after the day of Pentecost. This is after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, the presence of the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost did not delete godly traditions. Still, these two men are going up to the temple at 3 p.m. to partake in the routine traditional prayer. Amen? They had godly traditions, and because they had, the Spirit led them to on their way to their godly tradition of praying at 3 p.m., they passed by a lay man at the beautiful gate. This man is healed, and this becomes one of the most significant miracles in the early book of, of, of Acts. And now, if they hadn't had a godly tradition and followed along with it, they would not have been led by that lay man, amen? So God will use your godly traditions to speak to you and to lead you to the right place at the right time. Can we say amen, church? And also, God leads you through what I call Christian common sense. (laughs) Christian common sense. That's simply living alongside the basics of the Christian life. Love your neighbor. Pray for those in need. Help the poor. Do the basics that Jesus taught us over and over again. And when you do these things, God will lead you as you do them. And God will speak to you as you do. Amen. Amen. So basically, you can be led by the Spirit of God through all these ways for the rest of your life and have a great life. Amen. Still, there is one area of the kingdom of God, one area of the supernatural that God would love for you to grow in, and that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you personally. Now, this might not happen every day because we don't need it to happen every day. We have the word of God. We have godly traditions. We have Christian common sense, amen? And that will take us far. But there will be times when God needs you to do something that is out of the ordinary. There will be times when God wants you to do something very precise. Call that man now. Say yes or no to this offer. This is information that you won't have from the word of God. The spirit has to tell you in a specific and personal way. Through a thought, that you realize might well be from God and that you choose to act upon. Amen? So the Spirit will speak to you when you have to go out of your way and do something a bit unusual or uncommon. And we see Jesus operating in this. We see Jesus being specifically led by the Spirit many times. And we're going to read one of those times. This is John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And um, in verse 3 and 4, we read, So he, that is Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. When we read, this is the kind of statement that we'll just read and we'll just move on because we don't think it's really relevant or very informative. But there's a reason why John specifies That as Jesus walked from Judea to Galilee, he had to go through Samaria. Let me explain why this is really important. Uh, Here's a map of Israel right here. 
And for those of you in front, at least, you will be able to see that down south is Judea. So this is where Jesus is right now. And up north is Galilee. This is where he wants to go. And right in the middle, there is Samaria. So here we are on the other side of the world, 2,000 years later. And we think, well, it makes sense. It's the shortest route. If you want to move from Judea to Galilee, walking through Samaria makes perfect sense. Why is that even specified in the Bible that he had to do that? Because back in Jesus' days, no Jew in his right mind would ever go through Samaria. The Samaritans had a polytheistic religion. They believed in the God of Israel and the God of the Assyrians which was an abomination to the Jews. You shall have no other gods before me. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. And that's why Jews avoided the Samaritans at all costs. So when they were moving from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north or the other way around, they will go around Samaria, never through Samaria. But all of a sudden now it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Not because of traditions, not because of geography, but because the Spirit led him to. Jesus, I want you to do something unusual now. I want you to do something unnatural to you now. I want you to do something that your godly traditions cannot teach you. I want you to specifically walk through Samaria because the Spirit knew there was a woman by a well outside the city of Samaria and she needs Jesus. So Jesus walks through Samaria, specified by John, led by the Spirit, and because he is obedient, there is a miracle. My friend, when we obey the specific instructions of the Spirit, there will always be a miracle at the end. There will always be someone blessed. There will always be someone encountering the love of Jesus Christ. And because of the obedience, of Jesus at this time, a whole city in Samaria came to faith in Christ being the Messiah. Can we say hallelujah, praise God in the house of the Lord. And I've seen this so many times, the Lord speaking to me or to our church, giving us an unusual instruction. And when we put faith in the fact that this is not just a thought, this might well be the Holy Spirit. And we've obeyed, we've seen miracles. You know, many, many years ago, this was way before even the collapse of the Soviet Union. Back in the days when preaching the gospel in in Soviet Union was illegal, we were still sending missionaries in there, preaching to the underground church, you know, printing Bibles in Russian and smuggling them into this closed nation because God loved the people in there. And there was a spiritual hunger that neither Lenin nor Stalin could quench. Amen. So, so we were doing our best to you know, make the gospel of Jesus available in Soviet Union. All of a sudden, God spoke to us and gave us a word. And this was an unusual word. He said, I want you to raise $4 million in four years because Soviet Union is collapsing and the wall will be coming down. There were no signs whatsoever that that would happen at that time. And now $4 million in four years might not seem like the most gigantic accomplishment, but please understand, we were 300 people in church at the time. And this is Sweden. Our people are paying 57% income tax, 25% sales tax. Gifts are non-tax deductible and gas is $10 a gallon. Yeah, whoa, whoa, wow. I thought gas was expensive over here. Gas is so cheap over here. But let's not talk about that. So on top of our regular giving and tithing, God now wants us to raise 4 million US in four years from a group of 300 people. That seemed impossible. But by the grace of God and the wonderful heart of our church, we actually, after four years, managed to raise 4.1 million US dollars. And after exactly four years, the Soviet Union collapsed. The Iron Curtain came down. Russia opened up for the gospel and we were ready. 
We bought hundreds of VCR players. Anyone remember VCR videotape? Oh yeah, I see hands going up. I feel the presence. Yeah. We bought hundreds and hundreds of VCR players, just brought them right into Russia, spread them over the entire continent. We started recording revival meetings, Bible teaching in Russian, dubbed and subtitled to Russian. It was spread all over former Soviet Union and the spiritual hunger was amazing. And you know, as we moved in, according to the guidance of the spirit, we came across this guy who was like a former KGB general KGB was the Soviet secret police back in the day. And we met him and this guy was not a, a believer of any kind, but he was intrigued by our passion. And she said, you know, and he said, you know what? I have a train, I have access to a train. And this is the official communistic propaganda train from the old Soviet times. And we used it to go around all over Soviet Union and speak the gospel of Lenin, speak the gospel of Marx. And I don't know why I'm saying this, but I wanna give you access to the same train so you can spread your message, your gospel all over Soviet Union. So he gave us access to this train and for two consecutive years, we sent youth teams from our church boarded this train and went up and down the Trans-Siberian Railway. We stopped at every single city, hit the street, preached the gospel, led people to the Lord on the streets, and even today at every single city stop during the Trans-Siberian Railway, there is now a strong, flourishing Word of Life Church. Can we give some praise to the Lord? Even in the villages and small communities where we didn't have the time to stop, we asked the driver of the train to slow the train down so we could just kind of throw out Bibles in Russian and throw out books through the windows. And there were people running by the side of that train and they picked up the books and we just saw them pick them up and then pray that God will have his way. And I shared this testimony, people of God, I shared this testimony in Melbourne, Australia a few years ago. And at the close of the service, a couple came up to me and they said, we were two of those running by that train. We picked up a Bible, we read about Jesus, we gave our hearts to Jesus, and now we're pastoring a Russian-speaking church in Australia. Thank God for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Thank God that he speaks when it's time for us to do something precise and even a bit unusual, amen? So how can we grow in hearing and catching the voice of God? Let me just give you a few adv pieces of advice from the word. Number one, relax. Meaning don't overcomplicate. Don't cramp. I need to hear the voice of God. <laughs> and don't fear. Like fear is a major problem here. So many Christians think, well, I, what if I missed God? What if he already spoke to me and I missed it and now I'm in disobedience without even knowing it? I break that fear in Jesus' name. God is more anxious than you are that you will be led by the Spirit and he will come through when he has something to say to you, amen? So relax, let's read from 1 Samuel chapter three. This is a beautiful story when it comes to hearing the voice of God. This is the story of young Samuel encountering the voice of God for the first time. And we read from 1 Samuel 3, from the first verse, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of God was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. Where, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Now there are two major things here that I want you to take notice of. First of all, Samuel was doing two things right. He was at the right place doing the right thing. We read that Samuel was in the temple, right place. And in the temple, he was serving to the best of his ability. My friend, when you are in your temple, your local church, 
and you are rooted in that local church and you're serving the Lord to the best of your ability, you will be in a position in which God can and will speak to you when you need to be spoken to. Amen? Be at the right place at the right time. Also, please note that when God speaks, his voice can actually be mistaken for a regular human being. Amen? Amen. I mean, Samuel repeatedly thinks it's, that it's Eli yeah, yeah. that is calling for him. And I think, you know, it's, it, this is not the kind of Ten Commandments movie from 1959, Charlton Heston kind of voice going, Moses! <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. That was brilliant. Because <laughs> if you're looking for that, you're not going to hear anything. <laughs> Samuel thought this is the voice of man and he was mistaken several times before he understood. No, this is actually God. This is one of the greatest mistakes we make. We think it's the voice of man, namely the voice of ourselves. Our own thoughts, our own things that come to our minds. But when you dare to believe it's God and when you take a step in that direction, you're gonna hear the voice of God clearer and clearer and clearer as the years pass by, amen? So, um, you know, the, just being relaxed in the, in the attitude when it comes to hearing the voice of God will help you so many times. You know, I look back at my life and I realize that so many times where I've been led by the Lord, I wasn't even aware I was led by the Lord until after. And I realized when you look at the, how the Lord leads, the Lord, the Lord guiding you will be actually better seen in the rear view mirror of life than through the windscreen. We always want to see through the windscreen. What is going to happen? But many times when you look in the rear view mirror of your life, you understand, ah, I get it now. This is why this had to happen. This is why I walked through this. This is why I was taught this. And all of a sudden, it, it makes sense through the rear view mirror perspective. Amen? I remember one time I was led by the Lord without even having a clue. I was in Mexico speaking at a pastor's convention about eight, 900 pastors outside of Mexico City. And it was a four-day thing, and I was speaking three days. And um, uh, this was the last day. I was going to have my, my last few sessions. And, and there was... a. Um, the guy picked me up at the hotel, and they send new guys every day. So when we were in the car, it was a small car, you know, like the Beetle 67, like the real Volkswagen classic stuff. I had to fold my legs up to fit in the car. And we were going, and I made small talk. This is a new guy, so I asked his name and about his family. And then I asked, what do you do in church? And uh, he got silent on me. And then after a while, he said, well, actually, my, my walk with the Lord is not at a good place right now. And I, I asked, oh, really? What, what has happened? Tell me. And he started sharing how when he was a young man, he, he was on fire for the Lord and he wanted to serve Jesus. But then he made some wrong decisions in his teenage years. And now he was convinced that God was against him, that God hated him. And that God didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. And I said, you know what? God is right here in the car with us. He loves you. He doesn't hate you. There's grace for you. There's forgiveness. There's salvation. There's a new start. He started to cry. And he cried so hard, the whole car started to shake like this. I said, stop the car. And we pulled over, we we're like pulling over by a highway outside Mexico City. And this guy's crying, I'm preaching the gospel. I asked him, can I pray for you? I said, yeah. So I prayed for him, it was beautiful. The presence of God moved into the car. It wasn't very much space, but still. <laughs> and he gave his life to the Lord and it was just amazing. And after a while, just sitting there enjoying the presence of God and him, he, crying and laughing and just encountering God. I had to check my watch and realize we are gonna be late. And so I told him, man, oh, this is beautiful, this is amazing, but we really have to go now because I have the, the, the sessions. And he looked at me and said, but we're on our way to the airport. And I said, no, no, that's tomorrow. 
oh, no, 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 no. You need to get me back to church. I still have one day and then tomorrow is the airport. And he was all quiet, just looked at me. And then he said something I probably will never forget in my life. He said, you are Mr. Williams, aren't you? <laughs> and slowly I began to realize this guy is not my driver at all. <laughs> Turned out he was a random Uber taxi driver who just came to the hotel to pick up a Mr. Williams and drive him to the airport. And when he came, I assumed he was my driver. He assumed I was Mr. Williams. And all was great until Mr. Williams asked him how his relationship with Jesus was. And it, I just kind of went, Lord, the amount of heavenly coordination, the amount of heavenly coordination without me even having a clue, amen? Just wake up in the morning and say, Holy Spirit, I am available. And watch what happens, amen? Let's give the Lord some praise in the house of God. The second advice I want to give you in terms of growing in hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit is respond. Respond. When the Spirit speaks, it's because He wants something done. Not just an emotional experience, not just some spiritual massage to make us feel better. He wants something done. He speaks and He wants us to respond, to act on whatever He says. First Samuel chapter 10. This is Samuel speaking to Saul. It says, the spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will, be, you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do. And we say do, church. Do whatever your hand finds to do for God is with you. Amen. Amen. When you get that person in your thoughts all of a sudden, hey, that friend, I haven't seen him for years. Maybe I should give him a call. Give him a call. Yeah. Amen. Respond, take that small step. Go along with whatever thought that came into your mind in the presence of God, as long as it's godly and in line with the word of God, amen? And as you respond, you will grow in hearing the vo voice of God more clear as the years pass by. Now, I wanna introduce you to someone from back home. This is Annika. Annika was 14 at the time of this story, and if you sit close enough, you, you might see that there's something a bit off with Annika's eye, one of, the, one of her eyes. Annika is blind on that eye, and on the other eye, he, she's got only about 10% of normal seeing capacity. Now, on top of that, Annika is completely deaf on one ear, and on the other ear, she's got about 10% of hearing capacity. So... Medically speaking, Annika is almost blind and almost deaf. And Annika attended a, a, a meeting when I was speaking about being used by God and hearing the voice of the Spirit and being led by the Spirit. And Annika had an experience with the Lord that day. And she just made up her mind that from this day on, I'm going to change how I see myself. I'm not going to see myself as a case at someone waiting to be healed, someone waiting to be blessed by God. As I do that, I'm gonna realize that I can be used by God and I can be a blessing to someone else. And though my physical eyes cannot hear, my heart can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And she realized, I, I asked her to respond. So she went back home, this was November. She went back home and she thought, okay, what should I do? And she realized one way, of her to, of one way to her uh, responding would be to share the gospel with the uh, students in her school. So Annika attends a school uh, up north uh, with about 250 kids, all with various seeing and hearing disabilities. So what Annika did was she cut out 250 paper hearts. And then she got a list of all the students' names. And then she picked up the first heart, she wrote the first student name on one side of the heart, and then she just asked God, God, what do you wanna to say to this person? And then she sat in the presence of God, listening, until she got a thought, a word from God, a scripture, a greeting of some sort. And then she wrote that greeting down on the other side of the paper heart. And she picked up heart number two, and wrote the name of the second student on the list, asking God, 
What do you, Holy Spirit, want to say to this person? Throughout the course of three months, 14-year-old Annika prayed through every single student in her school, asking the Lord for a specific personal greeting to each one of them. And then on Valentine's Day, she brought 250 paper hearts to her school and she handed them out individually and personally to every single student. Now, when she retold this testimony to me, she said, Pastor Joachim, it's so great because at my school, everybody speaks sign language. So I can just go around the whole day and see what everybody was talking about. <laughs> and she said, wherever she went that day, she saw groups of students standing around going, how could she know? I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> how could she know what I was going through? How could she know that I needed to hear just that at this very time of my life? How could she know I've never met the girl and here she is giving me a heart that speaks straight to my heart. Annika, 14 years old, almost blind, almost deaf, could bring the love of Jesus Christ to her entire school by responding to the instructions of the Spirit. Can we give it up for God? I can't tell you what you're supposed to do, but I just want to give you that advice today. Respond. Whatever the Lord is whispering in your heart, step on it, act on it, do something, and you will see how God will honor his word. Amen. The very last thing I want to share before we take some time in the presence of God and allow the Spirit to speak to our hearts. Number three, reach out. Reach out. When the Spirit speaks to you, nine time, times out of ten, it will not be about you, it will be about someone else that he wants to bless, someone else that he wants to love on, someone else that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, I, I love how beautiful Jesus puts it in, in one of his parables in Luke 15. He speaks about a woman who had ten silver coins and lost one. And this woman is obviously God the Father, and the lost coin is obviously someone who is lost, someone that is out of reach for the love of God. And this woman starts searching. And in the process of searching, it says that she lights a lamp and she searches. Now, the woman is God. The coin is someone else, but the lamp, my friend, that's you. The lamp is me. The lamp is him allowing the fire of his Holy Spirit to start burning in our lives. Not so we can brag about that fire and compare who is most on fire. Because that fire should light up your world. That fire should make your world a bit more bright and a bit more warm. So God the Father can find that lost coin. Amen reach out and you know what as I prepared and prayed over this message the spirit just spoke to me and asked me to do something very specific right here at the end and I know that God is ready to speak to you and maybe you're here today and and, and you would say that I've never been aware of God speaking to me at all for many of you this might be the very first time out of many but we're just going to open our hearts right now and allow the spirit to speak to us in the relaxed presence of God, you will get a chance to hear, respond, and reach out. So let us stand up together in the presence of the Lord. And the way the Spirit of the Lord asked me to do this is that we'll all be standing in His presence for a little while. Can I ask you to just close your eyes? in the presence of God. It's nothing magical about closing your eyes. It's just a good way to not be too caught up with what's happening around you and just get your eyes on Jesus Christ. And what I want you to do now as you stand in the presence of God in the temple, I just want you to start thinking about the people around you, the people that make up your world. I know there are many of them. There will be relatives, there will be neighbors, friends, colleagues at work, fellow students. And out of all these people that move around your life on a weekly or monthly basis, 
I want you to think about one person. One person. Maybe someone who's going through a tough time right now. Maybe someone in specific need of the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Now I'm just going to give you a few seconds in the presence of God for you to zone in and focus on one person. And when you have, I want you to just lift your hand. And that hand lifted will be the sign, yes, I'm, I know exactly now. I'm, I'm thinking about this person. I'm going to wait until... Every hand is raised so that every single one is thinking about one person. Now that hand raised will represent someone that you're thinking of right now. You know what? I'm going to add my faith to yours right now. And I'm going to believe that that person's name and face did not show up inside of you by chance or accident, but by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because we are in the presence of God right now and the Spirit wants to speak to you in a relaxed, natural way. And I do believe for every hand raised that that represents the person that God spoke to you about right now. Because that person needs the love of Jesus Christ. Now what we're going to do in just a few seconds is we're going to pray for that person. But as we pray, I just want you to make up your mind on the inside that this upcoming week or the next, I will reach out. I will respond, I will send a text, I will make a phone call, I will pop over to that person's house, I will do something to communicate the love of Jesus Christ to that very person. And I do believe that when you do that, when you respond, when you reach out, you will be surprised as to how much that person has been ready to receive the love that you are right now are being prepared to give. So why don't you just raise your other hand as well and let's just take a minute to pray for that person right now and dare to put your faith in the fact that you were just led by the Spirit to think of him or her. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you that you are speaking to us in a relaxed way, Lord, and here we are responding. Here we are reaching out. Father, we pray for this person right now, believing from the bottom of our hearts that you had us think about that individual because you have something to say. You have something to do. You want to communicate your love. And Father, here we are responding. Here we are believing that you spoke to us. And in the upcoming weeks, Father, we make up our mind that we will reach out. We pray with the words of the prophet Isaiah, here am I, send me. As we leave this church, Church. in a few minutes time father we leave on a mission we leave led by the spirit we lead with a with a fresh word of the spirit to go out there and be that lamp in the hand of the woman to find that lost coin father as we do we pray be with us Lord give us the right words at the right time make us representatives and ambassadors of the love of Jesus Christ for that person. This we pray by faith in the beautiful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give some glory to the Lord and worship His holy name together. Hallelujah.